everyone. So in this lecture slide, I'm going to talk about the aspects pertaining to funding a new venture. And I'll talk a little bit about business plan. I'm not going to go through each and every one of these slides, but I'll kind of talk about some of the important highlights. All right. So for this lecture, I'm going to be talking about financing. So, so thinking about when you might pursue debt, when you might pursue equity. Talk about the business plan a little bit. I want to give sort of like a very topical overview. And then in the next slide, uh, next lecture, I'll talk about legal structures. So think about the different ways to organize a business. And as always, if you're interested in launching your own business, I think probably the best advice is to speak with a business attorney and actually to form uh, attorney-client relationships so that you've got that attorney working with you as your business grows. Anyway, so here we're thinking about the aspects pertaining to financing a new business. And the basic idea is there's this issue. You've got an idea, you've got a product, or you've got a service or something you want to bring to market. It's going to require funds to do so, and you, may not, you, might, not be, you might not have those funds available. Uh, one of the things kind of pertaining to the financial system in the, in the whole um, general sense is the goal of financial system is to be able to, to match up savers with uh, those who have like an excess of uh, funds and uh, lack of profitable opportunities to match those people with who have an abundance of profitable opportunities but have a lack of funds. And so the idea is you want to send the money from, you want to direct the funds from savers to spenders to be able to uh, to be able to grow and launch new products. All right, so the idea behind outside financing, well, you have the business idea and hopefully the managerial ability to make it profitable. Uh, you don't have the funds typically or are unwilling or unable to bear significant amounts of risk, at least necessary to be able to bring the product to market. And one of the things that's sort of typical about, about the income distribution is that people hit their peak uh, later on in life, and are, and, but at, at that point, they're probably much less interested in, on average, in entrepreneurial activities. On the other hand, those who are much younger have a lot of ideas and have a lot of uh, risk tolerance to be able to bring things to the market, but typically don't have the funds and haven't yet established the ability to get those funds via uh, credit and so on and so forth because they're uh, unproven. Anyway, so we'll kind of think about some of those issues here as we're going forth. In terms of like the basics behind financing or the basic kind of categories of financing, we have debt and we have equity. So we have uh, in terms of debt, we're thinking about borrowing and then ultimately paying it back with interest. With equity, we're thinking about giving up a share of the business in return for, um, you know, in, in return for funds to be able to spend on things that are necessary for growing the business. If you watch the video, if you watch the TV show The Shark Tank, typically these are like uh, equity type deals where the sharks aren't aren't giving loans to the prospective entrepreneur if they make a if they accept the pitch what they're doing is they're typically giving some 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 giving some amount of money in exchange for some substantial share of the business uh, anyway so we're thinking about debt in terms of well uh, retaining ownership but taking on literally debt and then having to pay back with interest and equity well you have the money but you give up ownership of your business now I mean in principle you could probably buy back uh, ownership of your own business and I'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about uh, VC and then angels debt is more risky from the entrepreneur's perspective and you can think of you think of why is like well to be able to pay back the the debt you need the product or you need the entrepreneurial activity to be profitable so that you have funds to be able to pay back the debt and if you don't you're still responsible for those for those funds on the other hand if you give up ownership of a business that ends up failing well you've given up comparatively little because the business has failed so um you know thinking about like the difference between having a business that's not worth anything and a several thousand dollar or several hundred thousand dollars debt versus the difference between giving up ownership of a business that's not very worth very much, right? All right, so some things to think about when we're pursuing, we're determining whether to pursue debt or equity. Some, you know, one important aspect is like equity simply might not be on the table at an early enough stage, right? 
So, but other things, assuming that you're actually making a choice here, think about, well, how risky is the particular aspect of the business that you're interested in funding? Is the entire business risky? Is the particular aspect of the business you're funding risky, right? Are you going to have something to stand behind some particular um, debt that you take on? This has implications for the type of funding that you'd want and actually for the type of funding you can obtain because if you've got some, if what you're funding is going to ultimately have something, some type of collateral, something that can be sold off at a loss, then it's going to be more likely you're going to be able to, to be able to borrow against whatever it is that you're funding. And then there's a problem of asymmetric information between yourself and your financiers in the usual sense that we have in a financial system, which is that those who approach others asking for loan on average are riskier, right? And so there's this problem because asymmetric inf the problem of asymmetric, asymmetric information, you have, a better, you have a better understanding of your project, of your ability to be able to carry it through, and your own, um, and your own dependability than does the financer. They have to kind of guess. And the problem is there's this issue of adverse selection, like I just said, which is that on average, those who are asking for loans could tend to be riskier than those who don't. All right. So, and then therefore, like amongst those who are asking for loans, we have to determine which are the good risks, right? All right, so in terms of the financing stage, we have seed stage and we have startup stage. So by, by seed money, we mean the small amount of money that's necessary to get you know, some type of like prototype or some, some sort of minimal, uh, minimal uh, amount to be able to launch some kind of preliminary aspects of the product. Right, and so you're thinking about launching an app. Well, you better have some funds to be able to do the programming, be able to, to be able to code the app. Right, uh, maybe money to be able to do market research, to be able to see if there's actually if the if the demand for the product is as favorable of you as you believe it is. Uh, to form the company formally, from the standpoint of like hiring an attorney to be able to uh, to be able to organize help you organize the business getting your management team together, creating the business plan, right? This is all, these are all things that are gonna cost money either explicitly or in terms of the fact that while you're working on these things, you're not probably working full time or you don't, you're not working as many hours at whatever you'd otherwise be doing. The startup stage, we're thinking about the money that's necessary to, um, to bring the product to the market. And so we're thinking about like some type of limited distribution and this might be also covering things like payroll, uh, marketing, other promotions, um, advertising, supplies, distribution, startup money. This is like this is we're thinking at this point is the money necessary to to actually bring the product in front of customers is the idea. So seed, we're thinking really preliminary. We're thinking about setting the foundation for ultimately having something that's going to lead to commerce and transactions. And startup money, we mean like literally starting up the business, not like now you are now you have customers, now you have transactions. Hopefully you have, in addition to your costs, you also have revenues, hopefully profits. Um, maybe not though. For the second round, we're thinking, well, if you're successful to this point, your product idea, it's probably feasible. Um, and so we're going through second round financing. There's still a problem of asymmetric information and there's still considerable uncertainty, right? So one issue could be the degree to which you're going to be able to scale the, the product. Like, are you going to be able to expand beyond the region or expand beyond the state or you know, beyond campus or whatever is the case? Also, we might worry a lot about long-term profitability, uh, especially if it's the case that the, that the product um, is, gonna, is, is taking advantage of like a particular um, expansion or contraction in the economy, whether you've got a normal or inferior good, such that once whatever that is, that macro effect goes by, maybe um, the demand for your product isn't as strong as you might have expected, or uh, other problem with long-term profitability is, well, maybe you have a really good idea. Maybe there's a lot of demand for the product, but now somebody else realizes this and then tries to swoop in and, uh, and uh, take over market share. So at this point, we're thinking about funding necessary to expand the business, thinking about uh, scaling up and thinking about uh, continued uh, development of the business. And then there's continued expansion made possible by future rounds of uh, financing. One important observation is that riskiness tends to decrease as you enter the future stages, just from the standpoint of the fact that by virtue of having survived, you've indicated that this is going to be, th this is more, it, we're updating the conditional probability of the, of the business um, 
being successful or failing and it continues to look much more like it's going to be successful the later that you're the longer that you're going in terms of sources of financing well typically we're starting off with like personal sources maybe family and friends family or friends could be debt or equities you could get a loan from family or friends or you could you could uh, offer a share of the business you could get bank loans this would be typically or so typically bank loans are going to be debt but this is typically going to be something that's going to happen after you've exhausted personal sources and family and friends and then there's uh, vc venture capital equity and then angel capital equity and these two i don't these two are kind of at the same so we got kind of two different couple different paths here so you wouldn't go from vc to angel right um all right Personal savings typically used for financing the seed stage of development. So the idea is, well, you've got who somebody's got to fund building your business plan and making the foundations, getting the team together, uh, coding up the app before you've got something that's that's been proven. And typically, this is going to come from your own sources and or from and or from family and friends. But typically, personal savings. One of the things that's really important is like if you don't have confidence in your project, why 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 would somebody else? And, but there's a limit here. There's, there's kind of a, there's kind of a limit. I think I forget the episode, but I remember, I remember on the shark tank, uh, Mr. Wonderful Kevin was watching or somebody was um, talking about how much money they put into it. And they asked him if he put, if, if they put their own money into it and they said something like, you know, they started off with $250,000 and then added to it and then went to their 401k or whatever their retirement. And Kevin's just groaning. He's like, Oh, Oh no. Why? Because it's like a terrible idea. This is something where you're, so at a certain point, if other people aren't having confidence in your project and if it's not working out, you know, you don't want to be just, you don't want, you don't want to be continually funding this business from personal savings and from loans from friends and family if the thing's not kind of taking off on its own. At a certain point, so all businesses are going to require quite a lot of funding to begin and are going to burn through it relatively quickly. But at a certain point, it's got to start being self-sustaining. Otherwise, there is an optimal stopping point, which is before you have spent millions of dollars on something that's not going to work. All right. So for securing future financing from outside sources, it's very important you have used a considerable portion of your own savings. Uh, and so there again, as I, as I mentioned, you want to sort of indicate, well, first off, like you might not have access to other sources of funding. Second, now you're signaling confidence in your own project. And, and then, as I said before, there's this optimal stopping problem to solve. Uh, so in terms of sources, well, sources of funds, well, you could do credit cards. So this is a quick, easy way to get small long-term loan. On the other hand, there is a super high interest rate associated with credit cards. And so this is, uh, this itself is pretty, this itself is pretty risky. So thinking, you know, so sort of be careful with, uh, as, as, as we are often told, be careful with, uh, credit cards. All right. Uh, family and friends, good for the seed stage and good for the sort of preliminary stages. Why? Well, at this point, when you're starting off, it's really difficult to get outside equity. Ultimately, hopefully, there's less asymmetric information with people you know. They're more likely to want a share of your business or, or to give a loan um, if they know you closely and then know something about your dependability, your worth, work ethic, um, your ability to your ability to be uh, optimistic but not overly optimistic about a particular idea, to have confidence in yourself but hopefully not overconfidence. And in, indeed, from friends and family, could be debt or equity. For bank loans, well, bank loans we're thinking about um, kind of the most uh, classic form of debt. And the benefit is cheap. Uh, the cost is, well, risky for the entrepreneur because now you're responsible for this loan. On the other hand, the bank realizes that this is risky for the entrepreneur and the banks might not be that interested in giving a loan at, well, some banks might not be that interested in giving a loan at different stages. Uh, so for less risky purposes, this might be a relatively reasonable way to go. By less risky purposes, we mean suppose you're trying to fund something like purchasing equipment. Maybe it's even specialized equipment, but equipment nonetheless that could presumably be sold off in the future, right? So you could recover some of the investment on some of the some of these capital expenditures. That's not an unreasonable thing to use uh, debt for. For more risky purposes, suppose the expenses are advertising or paying employees for product development, 
Now you probably don't want to rely on debt financing because now the money's gone. There's no way to be able to recoup whatever investment you had made as a result of that loan. So the problem is you're exposing yourself to lots of risk with debt financing in the case where you don't have anything to show for having, having made that expenditure. Also, as I said, banks don't like to lend for these more risky purposes, particularly long term, since there's no direct uh, collateral. And that's especially going to be true if, um, if you're just starting off. Even for relatively riskless purposes, it can be hard to get direct bank loans, especially in the seed and startup phase, uh, stages. And this is what I was talking about kind of earlier on, which is like some of these things just might not be on the table for our new entrepreneur. One of the things that kind of makes, kind of facilitates this process and kind of makes this a little bit easier is realizing that entrepreneurial activities, startups are risky, and realizing that banks aren't necessarily going to be interested in making these loans. The government's Small Business Administration will partially guarantee bank loans, and this makes the banks more likely to lend you the money because you've got this third party, you've got this government institution that's standing behind it. So this is particularly interesting at the present time during um, d with a lot of uh, with a lot of loans and a lot of assistance due to the um, due to the stay at home or safer at home orders. All right, other sources of debt financing. Well, uh, capital loans in the from the standpoint of um, loans against some of your assets, so inventory and equipment, clearly collateral things that could be sold off to uh, to those who you owe the debt to, or to benefit those who you own, owe the debt to. Trade credit, so this is actually s kind of super important thinking about how supply and thinking about how inputs work. So this is credit given by a supplier that's selling you materials, like inputs, raw materials, typically in the range of 30 to 90 days, because you realize whatever it is that they're, whatever inputs that you're getting, you know, even if you've got a profitable business, you might not be able to pay the full sum of these things on uh, at the time when you take receipt of the inputs and raw materials. On the other hand, once you've made your product, if you've got customers standing ready, even then it, you start having revenues coming in, you might be able to pay, you might be you know, super profitable, might be able to pay this back and more. And so one of, the, one of the things that the suppliers might do is they might give you, they might give you the inputs, uh, raw materials, and then have you pay back later on because they understand that the reason why you want their product, their inputs, is to be able to make future sales. They know that you're not making immediate sales, and especially depending on how the cycle of the business is working, you may not have funds ready at that moment, although you might in the future, and they don't want to lose a whole bunch of customers for their inputs and raw materials just because you've got this uh, problem. So this sort of lowers some of the transaction costs, sort of facilitates these transactions and it benefits them because now they've got you as a buyer, benefits you because now you've got them as a supplier and you've got inputs that you need to be able to make whatever is the whatever is the product. So typically this might range in the, this might go in the range of like 30 to 90 days uh, and kind of certainly varies by, you know, depending on the industry and depending on the particular supplier, of course. Then we have uh, venture capital, VC. So we're thinking about money invested by venture capital firms in startups and small businesses, hopefully with exceptional growth potential. So the majority of venture capital money goes for funding businesses that were originally funded by angel investors, by government programs, or by some other means. So the idea is like, tip. it's not typical to be able to get uh, venture capital immediately as you're starting off. It, so obviously there's always an exception to the rule, but most of it, most of the time, the majority of venture capital money goes to things that have already had other type of funding sources. I'll talk about partners and limited partners, general partners. I'll talk about that when I think about legal structures a little bit later on, but this is relevant for that. The investors who invest venture capital funds are limited partners. Those who actively manage the fund are general partners. It has to do with limited partners as if you're only supplying funds and then general partners is if you are uh, providing some type of managerial oversight uh, beyond just the investment. So we'll, we'll come back to that when we think about legal structures. Venture capital firms are those that are, that are managing funds of money with the goal of investing in new business ventures. Typically we're thinking about like pension plans, other long-term investors who are looking for a lot of growth and can tolerate risk. Um, 
and therefore have established this fund that's now going to go investing in uh, new business ventures. Non-liquidity is important because being able to tolerate non-liquidity is important because the VC investment isn't going to be recouped immediately. It's going to be several years down the road. So here we're thinking about equity financing, right? Funding is provided in, in, in return for partial ownership of the, of the company. And then thinking about the structure of the venture capital fund itself. Well, the job of the fund managers is to overcome the asymmetric information problem, right? To screen for good, ven uh, good venture opportunities and then to assist the company as needed, right? So for the entrepreneur to be successful, we need kind of a couple things. One of them is you got to have a, you know, a good product with a market. And then you've got to have the managerial talent to be able to make that work. Sometimes the venture capital fund can, uh, fund managers can help in that regard. The other purpose, is, like, like I mentioned, is overcoming asymmetric information. And so this is the, the idea of, well, you know, you've got a lot of startups, you've got a lot of businesses, and it's difficult to be able to sift through and determine which are going to be the successful ones. One of the things that the venture capital funds will typically do is specialize in certain types of companies so that they get really good at being able to identify the good making features of the ones that are likely to succeed or more likely than others. I mean, still most of them are going to fail, but they are hopefully able to screen for, um, for the, the best amongst those that are approaching them. Because these are very risky investments, venture capitalists are going to require very high expected rates of return. And so, the, so this sort of compensates for the really large risk that's associated. In terms of thinking about, things, thinking about the scope here, uh, the venture capitalists managing the fund receive a management fee plus 20 to 25% of the profits earned by the fund. Because of the lucrative nature of VC and because of high profile success stories like Google, Facebook, Dropbox, Twitter, um, we think quite a bit about venture capital. But actually venture capitalists fund very few entrepreneurs uh, in comparison to angels and relative actually to the number of firms seeking funding. So for instance, like back in 2014, for every 100 business plans that are submitted to venture capital funds, 10 get a serious look and one is funded, right? 10% get a serious look and then 1% is actually funded. What they're looking for is they're looking for the home run, right? They're looking for the one that's, that's gonna work out and then even, as, even though this is their goal, most of them still fail, but hopefully amongst the ones that they're funding, they have some really big winners. And that's the idea because if your fund has Google, if your fund has Facebook or Dropbox or Twitter, you can tolerate having a whole bunch of losers, right? So that's the idea. Uh, trying to find amongst this collection, you know, what, what's going to be the next Facebook or Google or whatever. Okay, so for those for which venture capital is a good option it, or is a viable option, it can be a good alternative to equity funding. And the idea is, well, venture capitals, because partially because of because of specializing in certain types of companies, um, and partially to speak to the the assistance that they're providing to the company, they can be really useful in terms of their connections with uh, customers, suppliers, governments, so on and so forth, especially depending on the size of the fund, right? And so the idea is that this can offer additional complementarities. This is interesting, thinking about what, for, what do venture capitalists look for in a business? So thinking from a study on venture capitalists in their own words, looking for the timing of market entry, is timing right? Thinking about competitive rivalry, Thinking about the lead time or the, 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 the distance before which rivals are going to start mimicking what you're doing. So how long are you going to be able to have in this market before you've now got to slice it up and lose market share? Uh, the scope of the business, uh, <laughs> industry re related competence, and then uh, educational capabilities. So thinking about like, are the, what's the capabilities of the entrepreneurs themselves? Ultimately, their VCs, when they're screening different companies, are interested in determining uh, your ability to run the business and your management team's ability to run the business. With the, with the old adage, success is 50% idea, 50% management. And you know, maybe, these, I, maybe, maybe these are a little bit too even. Maybe it's not quite 50-50 even in reality. It's important to, cons to convince the venture capitalists that you are capable of managing and being able to to see this project through. There's a long due diligence process, therefore. They're trying to screen the team and you should be doing your own due diligence uh, uh, process as well, determining like, is this a company that you wanna be working with? 
Ultimately, they need to have a realistic exit strategy. It's important how and when this will work. You know, is it the case that you're going to be that you're going to be buying back from? Or are you so the venture capitalists are going to be interested in selling the firm later, selling later on, selling their shares later on, selling the business? You might be able to buy back depending on how successful it's been. Uh, there's a lot of other things, but they're ultimately the venture capital VC business partner is not going to be permanent. But they will be your business partner, at least for the duration, and you need to consider this in your evaluation of them. So you think about their references, the other firms that they've worked with, the size of their fund, and then the degree to which a particular VC's connections might be useful for yours. Ultimately, the VC wants to get out as quick as possible. So usually not more than three to four years, maybe maybe five, six, you know, so there'll be examples where it'll be much longer, but their goal is to be able to turn a relatively relatively quick prod, uh, profit, but, you know, kind of depends on the industry as well as, uh, as other factors. Ultimately, it might be imp important to have non-disclosure agreements, especially realizing that the VCs and their management team are working with a lot of similar companies. And so remember I said that they like to they like to specialize in certain type of companies. And so it's important, probably on both sides actually, to have non-disclosure agreements, NDAs, such that, you know, whatever is, so that they don't just say, wait a second, this company, company X has this really good idea that would, that would be a home run in the context of company Y. Let's move it from company X to company Y, right? So we wanna think about, um, think about ways that, uh, that kind of prevent that from happening. All right, so we can also think about angel investors. I don't know, maybe I should put angel investors before venture capital. VCs are typically focused on large and late-term investments. Smaller companies in the early stages typically turn to an angel investor. So these tend to be wealthier people looking to invest in new ventures. Maybe they are themselves former entrepreneurs or retired execs or professionals thinking about their investment and their and working with you as a hobby for them. The typical angel financing deals might be between 100,000 and 500,000, but there can often be substantially smaller. So in terms of the volume, so 19, approximately $19 billion a year invested in 55,000 companies in 2008. Ultimately, the angel investor pools, but as big as the venture capital investment pool. However, they are investing in 15, 15 times as many companies. And so the idea is like the venture capital funds are very focused on with large investments in a few smaller, a few firms, whereas the angel investors have smaller investments in a lot more. The cash out time frame can be significantly longer than uh, venture capital. So maybe in the five to seven year range, though, again, depending on industry, these are like in all, all these amounts. I'm just these are just kind of uh, sort of ballpark figures. Other things or in terms of other factors, these are pretty similar to venture capital markets. They're going to do a similar job in from the standpoint of like specializing in certain types of startups. Uh, if they're a former entrepreneur themselves, maybe they're in the same industry. You know, you have people who are specializing in funding restaurants or something in food industry or retail or whatever. And so that's kind of their niche. Uh, ultimately, they're looking for a high rate of return. So think about in all investment, think about the opportunity cost of that investment, right? So you've got some, you just like think of yourself, you've got some amount of money, however large or small, think of what you can do with it. You can invest in a lot of different things. You could just hold it in cash. The opportunity cost of holding that money in cash is the foregone interest that you could have in a savings account. Well, that interest rate is less than 1%, so that's probably not a good idea. What's the opportunity cost of leaving your money in a savings account? Well, it's the foregone ability to use it for other things. So maybe for your own human capital investment, uh, tuition fees, so on and so forth. Maybe it's to invest in other investments like securities. And so thinking about uh, thinking about angel investors, well, they could invest in, they could be investing in like a, like a stock-based index fund, which would have a relatively high, which would have a higher rate of return than their bank account. What they're looking for is something that's going to be more interesting than that, right? So they're looking for something with a with a higher rate of return. They're going to take on substantially more risk, uh, but also, you know, they're maybe interested in this as a hobby or giving back to the community or something like that. All right. In terms of finding angel investors, well, this can be a lot more informal. 
until relatively recently, this is typically through personal contacts. Now with the internet, there's much more accessibility and ability to screen different angel groups. And there's a lot of other types of things in terms of like crowdfunding. One thing that's important to observe is that it's really, it's, it's really necessary to do due diligence here, even more so than with venture capital. There's a much higher variance, meaning that there's some that are going to be uh, some that are going to be really good to work with, some that are going to be really bad to work with, and there's a matching issue of like finding one that's going to be right for right for you. All right, first, so in terms of recapping, what's kind of like the key highlights of this portion of lecture? For seed initial investment, or for seed initial development, it's best to tap your own uh, money, family, friends, partners. Uh, in the startup stage, the decision of whether to obtain financing through debt or equity should be based on the size of the project and your risk assessment. So if you have low risk, small, uh, small size, uh, maybe capital type investments, capital meaning now you've got some collateral, then debt looks reasonable. If you have high risk, big non-capital investments, now equity uh, looks more reasonable. Po probably angel investors at this point, especially if you've exhausted family and friends. But um, anyway. In terms of thinking about how to raise funds, so I guess a little bit of guidance on this, it's really important to be prepared from the standpoint of like understanding how much to ask for, who to ask it of, and then how. So it's really important to determine how much money your company needs. Uh, Im importantly, if you know exactly how much you, you need, it keeps you from being caught short and from paying for or for paying for unnecessary capital. And it makes a really poor impression to be uncertain because it's just like you don't know how much money you need. Well, why are you asking? Like you can't, I'm not going to fund you if you don't, if you don't know how much you need because you don't want to make an investment that's too small. I learned this lesson the hard way, making a proposal to um, to an organization that was providing grants for experimental economics, and I sent my proposal with my dissertation advisor, and we were expecting that we would get it. And I didn't ask for enough money. I was too modest, and I didn't. I was. I was thinking, oh, if I, if I ask for a smaller amount, maybe they're more likely to grant it. No, they wrote back in their report, and they're like, this, you haven't, you haven't asked for enough. You've asked for, matter of fact, like so little that we wouldn't expect that this is going to work. <laughs> and so there's sort of like a sort of like a important wake up for myself, which is like, you might have this inclination. To try to to try to be frugal and to try to go at the the lower bound, I don't know if you've got a range. If you're if you've got some bound within which you're uncertain, I I don't know. You kind of talk to other people, but I might shade towards the higher end because if it's obvious that you've asked for too little, uh, that can be just as bad as uh, as paying for unnecessary capital. Right? Maybe even worse. All right. So determining the most then then you want to determine the most appropriate type of financing or funding, whether um, whether it's equity funding. Well, in this case, it demands high standards of growth potential, a clearly defined niche market and then proven management. And so so you want to think about, well, do you need uh, debt or equity? And then if you are pursuing equity, well, you need to have these things in place. You have to have likely high likelihood for growth. You have to have a clear niche product and, and demand. And then, you know, hopefully you've got the managerial capability to make it work. Last thing, super important, is you need a strategy for engaging your potential investors or bankers. So you need an elevator speech or pitch. In particular, it can be helpful to get a personal introduction with the people that you're going to be pitching, right? One thing to keep in mind is that people are approached all the time with business plans and most are never read. So what you would need to do is like, hopefully you've got a personal introduction through some important contact that's useful and ask them to introduce you. But then beware, um, when they do introduce you, you need to have a complete and competent business plan because now you've got two people that you have to be important not to let down, right? You, you want to first make a good impression on the potential investor, second, you don't want to reflect poorly on your contact that has brought you in front of that person. And that can be really important, right? And so remember, when you go to meet with them, you've now got two goals. Your first goal is you would like to get funding. 
your, that's like your A goal. Your B goal, which you absolutely need to, to, not, uh, to not fail to, is to avoid burning that contact, to avoid uh, embarrassing your contact who's got you that introduction. It's, I- importantly, if the potential investor just decides that they don't want to invest in your project, um, but they're otherwise impressed by, uh, by you, and they might be able to help, they might themselves be able to help you find um, an opportunity in the future. And so that can be, that can be really important is try to make sure that, uh, try to make sure that this goes well. So, all right, the last thing I'll talk about is business plan. Here, I'm just gonna give sort of a topical sort of overview. If you were assembling a business plan, there's a lot of internet research and different types of advice that you do outside of the context of the class. Um, so I want to talk about the goal of the business plan and thinking about the section of a, of a typical formal business plan. This is different from your pre-business plan for class presentation. So uh, like I said, this is a very topical overview. You'd want to look at the class reading, also pretty topical. You want to look at books, look at internet, these types of things for advice on assembling a business plan. The goal of the business plan is kind of twofold actually. Here, I'm talking about like your goal of convincing potential investors or lenders. It's also kind of important to convince yourself that it's a good project, right? Because once you've got the business plan, this kind of gives you um, a way to really clearly organize your thoughts. And sometimes an idea that seems really good, once you've got it done on paper, you realize it's not, or you start seeing things that you can address. And so this, I, the way that I'm writing this up is thinking about the goal of the business plan being really important for convincing investors and lenders, but it's also an educational experience for yourself. Anyway, so you want to convince them that your proposed business has a profit potential and that you, in particular, have the capabilities, experience, foresight to be able to make this profitable, right? You want to convince them that there's a lot of value added and that you're going to be able to capture a lot. You'll be able to capture a lot of it. Uh, Indeed, this is a learning experience for the entrepreneur itself, right? If your proposed venture is marginal, doing the necessary research and writing out the business plan should help you learn this. Then think about ways to rectify, to be able to address problems. Possible sections that'll be included, well, your cover letter, title page, table of contents, executive summary, business identification statement, management personnel list, marketing or market overview, services description, competition analysis, marketing strategy, critical risks, and financial projections. Critical risk, I'll talk about this at the end, but critical risk, this is important because a lot of times people want to, you want to go in and you want to say, oh, this is a good project and there's no risk. (laughs) Or... This is a good project and there's no serious threats. Uh, That's the wrong way to approach the business plan. That's the wrong way to approach the pitch. What you wanna do is you wanna identify the critical risks. You wanna say, look, this could be a serious threat. However, here's what we'll do, right? So this could be a serious threat. We're gonna kinda monitor this. This is something that we're gonna be worried about. This This is how we will address whatever is this risk. And amongst the critical risk is always the unforeseen stuff, such as a pandemic, right? You think about like, what do we do if all, what do we do if things really go, really go wrong? Well, the the idea and one of the things that's important with the business plan is to have like a really well thought out, competent assessment of what it's going to take to make this business work. And part of it is making an honest assessment of the critical risks and then, and therefore being able to Uh, come up with ways to address it and to be able to identify, hey, if this business fails, it could be because of this reason. All right. So if there's a short, so the executive summary, we're thinking about like a short two to three page summary of the business plan, talking about the background, talking about the business opportunity, thinking about your basic strategy and goals, thinking about the funding requirements, sort of being honest about what what funding is necessary. And then uh, thinking about your forecasted profitability and the likely return on investment. You need to convince the reader to, to read on. And you probably want to write this last. I'd say probably actually want to finish this last. You want to probably write this in several revisions. Make sure it's well written and write this a couple times. You have to convince the reader to read on, but you have to make an honest assessment here as well. So you need to be exciting, but you also need to be competent. And so you need like realistic funding requirements, realistic for realistic forecasted profitability. In particular, thinking about your funding requirements, as I was saying before, if you're pitching somebody that's got, and hopefully you are, that's got a lot of experience in this industry, they're going to look at your funding requirements. They're going to look at your strategy and goals, and they know how much you need, or at least they've got a pretty good idea. They are at least going to think they know how much you need. 
if you're way off, that's gonna that, that that's gonna be a problem, right? So you want to be really, really good in your investment or assessment of the of the funds necessary. For the business identification, well, you're including name of business, where it's located, legal status of the business. We'll talk about that in legal structures, the product uh, the schedule, what the funding will be used for, so what your expenditures are. Then your management, your personnel list. For, your man for the individuals in management, that you need their position, their experience and qualifications with their resumes, uh, ownership, wages, benefits, and list outside consultants who will be particularly important. And then thinking about personnel requirements that are, that's necessary to make this business work. Uh, in terms of the market overview, you want to think about the description of the market. You want to think about the existing firms, the consumers. Think about current sales, market trends. You do kind of a careful economic analysis about what the what the profitability in the market looks like, right? Is there a profit opportunity? Is there a lot of value added? What's the profit opportunity? And then where's your market research or data supporting this as a, as a profit opportunity? So you don't want to just say, I, you know, I think this is profitable or everybody that I've talked to says this is a good idea. No, you've got to have done some research. Hopefully you've got market research, surveys, data, somehow supporting the idea that and reinforcing your belief that this is profitable. In terms of the description, well, you want to think carefully about the product that you're selling. Think about the characteristics. Think about the production process, the input used, how this works. Why the, prod why the product will address the above profit opportunity. So if you're successful in realizing that we've got a profit opportunity, how do we know that the product that you're making is going to fill this profit opportunity. How are you different from existing competitors? Where's the value created in your business? And then uh, having some type of data to back this up is important, um, as well as uh, plans for the future. For the competition analysis, you want to think of who are the competitors, who are the potential competitors, who are the future competitors? How do their products differ from yours? What's the extent of product differentiation? Are there quality and cost differences? And what are your advantages? Um, in terms of thinking about market shares and prices and um, information on profits, this can be useful getting a sense of the, of the competitive balance in that particular market. You also want to think about the pricing and promotional strategies by uh, competitors. How intense is competition? Remember I was talking about tacit collusion. One of the reasons why I think about tacit collusion is being able to recognize the likelihood that there's currently tacit collusion happening in the market or that the mar otherwise that the price is unusually high. So. How intense is the competition? What, is, what do you think is going to happen with, with potential entrants coming in? What's the reaction of competitors? Uh, what aspects of the market might make entry easy or hard? If it, if it looks like there might be, if it looks like the prices might be relatively high relative to the, the you believe the uh, potential strength of the incumbents in the market, you want to be ready for the price crashing down when you enter if they're going to try to, uh, if they're going to try to react and try to try to maintain their uh, dominance. Other important aspects of the market. So you want to think about, well, are the network externalities? This is important for whether you're able to grow market share, thinking about the dynamics over time, um, and thinking about entry deterrence opportunities, both for you in the future blocking rivals from coming in, and also uh, the degree to which uh, there could be entry, <laughs> entry deterrence levied against uh, your startup. Uh, in terms of marketing strategy, yeah, think about your pricing, think about advertising and promotion, think about your ad copy, where to advertise, how much to spend on advertising. Think about like elasticities here, like think about your rel uh, relevant price elasticity of demand, advertising elasticity of demand, and then our elasticity formula giving us a sense of how much to spend on advertising. Um, you might think of like other really important decisions, think about uh, distribution, think about your expected market share and revenue. And then critical risk. You want to bring up potential risks before investors point them out. And you want to provide strategies for dealing with them. So what about competitors cutting prices? What about competitor innovation? What if there's more entry than you anticipate? What if the costs are, high, are higher than you expected? Maybe there's problems with inputs. Maybe your, sale, your sales projections are not achieved. Anyway, so all these things, presumably the competent investor that you're bringing this in front of, it's, it's going to is going to have an idea of what are some of the important critical risks and you better have a pretty reasonable strategy for dealing with them both from the standpoint of indicating that you've carefully and thoroughly thought about what could go wrong and you haven't been flippant in terms of like dismissing these threats instead you're saying no okay this is what we're going to do or this is uh, this is why 
we believe that that we'll be able to address or how we'll be able to address this risk. In terms of financial projections, it's difficult. So the most daunting part of the business of the business plan. So you need your balance sheet, your assets and liabilities, you need your profit and loss income uh, statement. So uh, your revenues and, and costs, think about cash flows. So think about your inflow and outflow. And maybe you'd consult with a with an accountant or business attorney as you are thinking about financial projections. Uh, ultimately, thinking about how you would project your revenues. Well, for sales for your business, hopefully this is going to be increasing over time by virtue of advertising, by virtue of word of mouth, uh, repeat customers. Uh, typically, you'd start with the beginning, zero, and an end point. So the revenues after you've come into the market and captured your uh, market share. And then your end point uh, revenues should be determined in the market strategy section. You want optimistic but realistic assessment to what the business can do if everything goes as expected. You don't want it to be too optimistic. You want it to be optimistic yet realistic. Uh, in terms of financial projections, so you're thinking about, uh, thinking about the sales path and then uh, think about some intuition about why your, um, wh why, your, why, your, why your financial projection might take a particular path. Um, I noticed that I, I lost this and I'm on a different machine, so I, I'm, I, I don't have this image, so whoops. Uh, and then general points. You want to be precise about your business uh, goals and timetable. Ultimately, you want to signal that yourself and your partners have the skills and commitment to make them successful. You want to be optimistic but realistic with your goals and numbers, making sure that you have the most influential arguments and then the best data possible to back up those uh, numbers. You want to be careful in your in your reflection and showing that you're thoughtful when you're assessing the likelihood of risks as well as your capability to be able to address them. Um, you don't want to try to do too much. Don't don't over diversify. You want to be kind of really focused and doing really well what your business is going to be, uh, where your business is going to be adding uh, value. So anyway, hope you enjoyed this video. Go ahead and conclude here.